got that print statement, which is cool. Got no problem with that. But let's see if we can give you a little bit more in your toolbox. Okay. Oh, hey, I think this is the last one of these I have. But it's uh, one more job description. Shall we just take a quick look at it and see what they look for? Sure. So this is a uh, hey, yeah, soft look at New York, Texas. They're looking for, it's interesting. Because this is not a technical thing. This is just like, this is what, where we want your brain to be at, type of stuff. You want to have a mindset uh, aligned to the Agile Manifesto. So basically, use the code, talk to the customer, do some code. Okay. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. You want you to talk to people. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Okay. So this is startup land. It means they don't have any documentation. Okay. Customer collaboration over contact, contract negotiation. All right, they don't have a legal department. And responding to change over following a plan. They don't have a plan. Have a plan. <laughs> so you just have to understand the reason. So it's a little startup that's looking for some assistance, is what they're saying. Core technology competence, they want you to know Python. Uh, Django, Django. 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 Django is Django. Gotcha. What it is is basically a series of Python uh, routines that can allow you to basically do stuff, practical stuff. Okay, Windows and such like that. JavaScript, which of course is a whole other language. Okay? And MongoDB, which is an open source database. Uh, value and technology confidence, just that you're smart. HTML5, AngularJS, which is a set of libraries. No idea what RabbitMQ is. Git is how you uh, keep track of all your software. Check it in, check it out. Jenkins, and of course, Agile as a design methodology. Okay, experience. Uh, software design patterns. Let's talk about, let me know what software design patterns are. Okay, they are exactly what they sound like. They are software design patterns. So software design patterns are, look, in software, uh, not that much is new. So if somebody asks you to do a, you know, a user interface, or if they ask you to do a database lookup, or if they ask you to encrypt something, somebody's probably already done it, right? And so a software design pattern is basically best practices for doing a particular task. They don't have software design patterns for everything, but for common things, there are software design patterns. Now, the software design pattern is not written in any given language. It just sort of lays out the basic steps that you should go through to do something. And then your job as a software developer is to take the design pattern and encode it in whatever language you're working on and use the variables and the database and all the stuff that you're using on, on your project. But a software design pattern gives you basically an outline of what you want to do. Okay? Um, have a level of maturity allowing them to work with a diverse set of clients. Don't be a big jerk. <laughs> All right, show up for meeting clients or something like that, right? Be able to demonstrate above average competency with three out of four uh, core technologies. Again, what we're talking about. And revel in using their mind and all it has to offer. Whatever, okay? This is clearly a startup looking for some assistance, right? They're looking for somebody who's technically smart, who can actually work with customers, and who can live in an environment that doesn't really have a lot of documentation or a really solid plan. Not a not code, okay? but they're willing to hire, so let's go for that. All right. So shall we talk about variables? Fantastic. So here's an interesting question. If I wanted to count how many people were in this class, well, there's a lot of different ways I could do it. But if I wanted to start with an empty classroom, and then I wanted to count people as they came in, I could come up with like a laser beam. <coughs> I powered laser beam, not powered, but anyway, stretched across the door. Okay? And I could hook it up to my computer. And then every time somebody came in through the door, you'd break the beam. And the, the computer program would go, ah. another person has entered the room, and it would increment the number of students in the class. Does that sound, sound acceptable? Yeah. Not too terribly technical. Okay. Now, when I start out, how many students are in the class before anybody arrives? Zero, right? Now, so I've got this number zero. I gotta, I gotta put it someplace. So I'm going to put it in a variable. I'm going to put it in a location in the computer's memory. I don't even care where it is. Somewhere in that computer's memory. I'm going to put zero. But I have to remember where I put it. Because when the first person that walks through the door comes in, what am I going to do with that zero? I'm going to, I'm going to replace it with a one, right? Or increment it or whatever you want to say. Yeah, I'm going to replace it. But I have to know where I stored the zero, right? Because it's somewhere in the computer's memory. So I have to name that location. Just like when you go home today, your house has an address, right? That's how you know where to go. Okay? All right? And if I wanted to replace you, I'd get another family to move into your house. You can move out, and I'm moving a new damn family in, okay? Okay, same thing with variables, okay? So it's a location in the memory, and I'm going to give it a name. Fantastic. 
variables in Python, we're not going to name it, there's a, just very simple rules. Python's actually pretty cool about this. When you're coming up with a name, it has to begin with a letter or an underscore. But you're an idiot if you start with an underscore. <laughs> but what does this mean that it cannot start with? A number. Can't start with a number. Okay? That's all they're saying. It has to start with a letter. Okay? Okay, Python variables do not have to be explicitly declared. So, this is a humongous difference between Python and Java and C and C++ and C Sharp. In those complicated languages, before you use a variable, you have to tell the program about it. I'm going to have number of students, because that's what I'm going to be counting. And it says fantastic, and it reserves a location in the computer's memory. And then when it hits your code, and you say increment number of students, it says, fantastic, I know where that is. And it knows exactly where to go to do it. Python is completely different. Python says, ah, don't worry about it. You know, you need something, you tell me, I take care of you. So it's running through your code. And it hits number of students equals zero. Whoa, I haven't seen this before. I guess it's a variable. I should stop everything. I should go make a memory location. I need to call it number of students. Okay? So in Python, you don't have to pre-declare anything. You just use it. And when you use it, Python stops, creates a variable somewhere in memory, and then just keeps on going on. Which is cool for you. Because you don't have the argument. You don't have to worry, let's see, what kind of variables am I going to use in this program? And what are they going to look like? And what you have to do in Java and C. Okay? But you do not have to do in Python. Python just cruise on. When you need a variable, just use it. No big deal. Okay? You don't have to declare it. So I'm telling this to you because someday you will take a C course or you'll take a Java course. And you'll be like, declare variables. Really? I've actually written a game once and I had 50 lines of variables. Yep. Easily. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially if you have anything that is large. And you have to be very careful about what types they are and all sorts of stuff like that. So, yeah. So, once again, this is Python's gift to you. Python makes your life very easy. If you need a variable, just go and use it. Yes, sir. You say you declare it exactly the same as define. Define and declare exactly the same thing. So what we're actually talking about there is generally in a language like C or Java, not only are you going to say this is a variable that I'm going to use later on, you're going to say this is the type of variable. Is it going to be an integer? Is it going to be a floating point number, which we'll talk about here in just a moment? Is it going to be some character, or is it going to be some array? I'm just curious because uh, can you, you can still define an init just like if you're already good. Can you do that? In Python, you cannot. You can't define it. It doesn't have any. It doesn't have the ability to define. It doesn't. Work. Although, let me take that back. If you are hard set in Python, I really want to define it. I could be at the top of my program. Number of students equals zero. Okay. From Python's point of view, it's just number of students equals zero. From your point of view, I've defined number of students. I've indicated that it's you know. So it'd be for you, your emotional well-being. Okay. You can also put a comment in there, right? You put a hashtag and say number of students is a you know in the integer used to store number of students in Python. So you can do a lot of things. But from Python's point of view, it does not care about that variable until you use it for the first time. Does that make sense? Okay. And that is a huge difference between Python and all those other languages. Python's making your life easy. Ah, the operand to the left of the operator is the name of the variable. Number of students equals zero. Number of students is the variable name. Zero is the expression. It's whatever you want to shove into number of students. Okay? Um, here's some examples. Counter equals 100. Uh, where's the variable? Counter. Very good. Excellent. Uh, miles equals 1,000.0. Now this is an important one, a little cell phone, we'll talk about it a little bit more. There's a difference in Python between 1,000 and 1,000.0. So 1,000 would be an integer, which means it's just a number from 1 to 1 billion, okay? Uh, point zero means it's a fractional number, or a real number as we like to call it in computer speak, okay? And it's just a different type of number, and inside the computer it stores it differently. And now I'm here to name equals double quote, John double quote. Did you guys use double quotes in your print statement? Yeah. Exact same thing, right? First double quote tells me the, the sequence of letters starts. Guess what the last quote tells me? It's all done, right? Okay, that's all there is to that. Python names can be have an unlimited length. There's no limit on how long they can be. Keep them short. You got the double quotes. Yes, that's, and that's a good observation. Numbers, 
Well, you know, if I put double quotes in the numbers, what would I be telling you? A string. string. I'd be telling you that it's not a number, but it's a sequence of characters. One, zero, zero. So I could put quotes around it, but if I put quotes around counter, so if counter equals quote 100, end quote. Fantastic. Python's got no problems with that whatsoever. But well, what I can't do is I can't do counter equals counter plus one. If it's a string or a sequence of characters, I can't say plus one, right? It's like a bunch of red letters and says, what the hell are you doing? No way. I mean, this is a bunch of letters, right? So if I make it a number, no quotes. Then it goes, oh, 100. Why? And if I say make it one more, it says, oh, 101. I fully understand. So the that is exactly right. It's a number as opposed to a sequence of characters. Everybody good? Okay. Variable names, good, bad, and ugly. Okay, look, it's your program. You're the one who's going to live with it, but I do have to grade it. So it's very important to me that you actually get this variable name stuff correct. And there's a thousand other coders that you'll probably work with during the course of your professional career who will pound you into the ground if you do a bad job with your variable names because they have to live with it, right? So, what's a bad variable name? X. Is it valid? Yeah. Yes. Hell yes, right? And in Python, capital X or lowercase x will also be validated. And those will be two different variables, right? Lowercase x versus uppercase x. But it's lousy because what does x mean? I have no freaking clue. Okay? Student underscore ID. It's a good one, right? I know what it is. It's easy for me to read if I'm looking at it. Num students. Notice that this S is capitalized. Does Python care? No. If it wasn't capitalized, that would be a completely different variable name, right? So num students with a capital S, num students with a lowercase s, two separate variables. Uh, capitalization is very important to Python. It just understands that those are different things. If you capitalize a word in the middle of a variable name, it makes it really easy visually to read. And you'll find that this is really sort of the common way people do their variables these days. Okay? Number of students enrolled in class. Is that a valid variable name? Yes. Does it a sucky yes. variable name? Absolutely. Look, no capital letters, first off, so it's somewhat difficult to read. And it's about this big, okay? I don't need that. Okay? Because otherwise you're going to take up most of the line with just your variable. That's stupid. Okay? Stuff. Is it valid? Yes. Does it suck? Yes. It does. It's really not very good. A good variable name should indicate its use. Okay? So think about your variable names as sort of being a way you can document what your program is doing. Right? If I understand what the variable is, I'll sort of understand what you're trying to do with it, and it makes everything a little bit clearer. So bad names. Single letters, we we'll talked about that. Naming things after their type. My number, my string. No, come on, please don't do that. Extremely vague names. Do stuff, process files. Sequential names, DNA, DNA2, DNA3. Stop doing that. Reusing names. Well, I used it for this for a little while, then I got bored and I started using it for this. Wait, what? What? What's going on? Don't do that. Use it once, make it clear, okay? And names that only vary by case or punctuation. My DNA versus my DNA, DNA, all being capitalized, okay? Don't, yeah, look, you know, in Python, depending on whether or not things are capital or not, it's a different variable. Stop it! Don't play games like that, because it's going to be too subtle for me if I'm looking at your code. It's going to be too subtle for you. You're going to make mistakes, and it's going to make your life a lot harder. Okay? Good variable names are a key way to document what the heck your code does. So keep it clean. All right, so let's talk about math in Python, which isn't nearly as scary as it may sound, but that's okay. So first off, we're going to start with the normal stuff, stuff that you guys do every single day. So addition, it is exactly what you think it is. Variable name plus other variable name. You got plus on your keyboard, some of us there, right? Subtraction, A minus B, exactly what you would expect it to be. Uh, multiplication is a little bit weird, but you basically have fun here. So it's A star B. What star on the keyboard? Is it like shift? Shift eight. Okay. So the star means a multiplication. We're good to go with that. And division is A slash B. What is it? Rising slash or left to right slash or whatever. It's one of the slashes, right? That's division. You guys are all comfortable with it. Ah, we get no problems with that. Right after we get done with the normal stuff, we'll get into the weird stuff. Okay. A slash slash B is what's called floor division. Basically what this means is you do the division, and assuming that it's not like 2 goes into 4, it's something that has a remainder, you throw away the remainder. That's all floor division is. Just throw away the remainder. 
If you can wrap your head around that, then we move on to A percent B, which is called uh, modulo, which is exactly the opposite. You do the division, and you only keep the remainder. Okay? A little bit weird, a little strange. It's not that complicated. It's just not necessarily something you do every single day, right? Negation basically means you just put a hyphen in front of the variable name or the number. Okay? Very simple. Uh, absolute value, which means what? If I have a negative 5 and I take the absolute value of the negative 5, what do I have? 5. I just strip off the negative. If I have a positive 5 and I take an absolute value of it, I have 5. five. That's all there is to it, right? So you do ABS, print, print, and then put whatever you want to take the absolute value in the middle. Okay? Exponent. A star star B. Two stars means stick it up to the power. So 2 star star 2 is what? Four. It's 2 squared, or 2 to the second, which is what? Four. Hey, that is the color to it. Then things get a little bit weird when you do square root. It's math dot square root print A. So the subtlety of what's going on here is square root is something that you don't do every single day. So what Python does is it puts it in a separate library called math. And if you want to use it, you bring that library in, then you can access it by saying, I want to do stuff in the math library, specifically I want to do the square root function, and then that's all you have. Make sense? Okay, so that's math in a nutshell. Let's do some math together. Module is the weird one, okay? So let's take a look at it and see what we got going on here. So here's the first question I have. A man has 113 cans of Coke. Unfortunately, he has boxes that only hold 12 cans. After he loads all of his Coke into boxes, how many cans of Coke is he going to have left? Well, we can have Python do it. We got a powerful computer here. So the print. How many cans of Coke do we have? And then I, what, I want to do modulo maybe? So what is that? Is that a percent. Percent. percent? And how many cans wow. can I fit wow. into a box? Wow. Wow. So should this tell us? Now what's this going to tell us? So we want to divide 12 into 113 because that's basically taking care of how many cans we can put into it. So that would, if we did that and it came back and tell us how many boxes of Coke we had. We don't care about that, right? Our question is what? <coughs> Left over. So it's sort of like the remainder of the division, right? So this should tell us that, right? Five. So we got five cancel for Five. Not really the end of the world or anything like that, but you see how modular works, right? Okay, what's our second one here? On a military base, clock in the wall says the time is 2300. What's that in like real time? But let's see if we can get a Python to tell us, right? So modulo what? 12. 12? So it tells us that 2300 is really what? 11. Alright, last question. My friend is the proud possessor of 10,432 ping pong balls. And he's going to move his fantastic ping pong ball collection across town. So he's asked me to show up. And in my station wagon, I can transport 7,239 balls. How many will be left over after I leave? Now, how do you know that? <laughs> how do I know what? Right, your car can hold exactly <laughs> Because what I did is I took you, measurements. You helped him move I took measurements. Because <laughs> <laughs> our life is this big. Good kill ping pong balls that much. Actually, I have individual ping pong ball containers, and that's the way. Uh, <laughs> Alright, so somebody write these numbers down. What is it? 10, 4, 3, 2, and 7, 2, 3, 9. So, admittedly, what's the simplest way to do this problem? That minus that. Yeah, okay, well, so we know that, okay? But let's do it in a complicated way. This is more software developers. Alright, what was the number? 1, 0, 4, 3, 2. Okay. The second one is 7, 2, 3, 9. <coughs> and the 
answer is that we will have 3,193 ping pong balls left after my station wagon pulls away. All right, so that's modulo. So here's the thing, you're not going to use modulo every single day. In fact, you may not use it for a really long time. But the cool thing about modulo is it shows up at the weirdest times, right? It's a powerful function. It's basically just the remainder. If I do all this stuff, what's left over is the gist of what's going on there. Same thing with the floor division. If I, floor would have told me, on the, on the coke one, would have told me how many oh, boxes. How many boxes? Let's do that real quick. Just, does that make sense? So we're going to do so. We had 113 cans. We wanted to do a floor. And we're going to divide by 12, right? So the question is, is how many boxes of coke were we going to have? So once again, you don't use these functions every single day, but they're like something that you keep in your back pocket. And you will encounter situations where it's like, oh, yeah, that'd be handy to you. You whip it out, and everybody's like really impressed that you remember that it's there. Nobody else knows. All right. Please note, this smells like a test question to me. Got it? Can I be any more clear about this? Can I send you a note? Can I pencil it down there? So precedent. What is precedent? Well, basically, if I bump into a really long and complicated math expression in Python, how is it going? What's the value? 2 plus 3 times 5 raised to the 6 power divided by 7 uh, multiplied by 4. Uh, what is that? I have no freaking clue. Okay. So precedence rules tell us how to evaluate a mathematical expression. And it's really pretty simple stuff. You just got to remember a few things. The very first thing you have to remember is exponents number one. If something's raised to a power, figure out what that is before you do anything else. Okay? When you get done with that, unary negation. So basically turning something into a negative number is number two. Get that taken care of? Next one. Multiplication, division, and remainder are evaluated before addition and subtraction. So basically multiplication and division beat addition and subtraction. Get that taken care of. Then move on to addition and subtraction. And when they say final one is addition and subtraction are evaluated before assignment. So I figure out that 2 plus 3 is 5, and then I go ahead and stick it in the variable sum. Okay? With two exceptions, we evaluate all the stuff going from left to right. So for example, like this one here. We go from left to right, so we'll figure out 3 times 4, which is what? 12. Divided by 6, which is what? And we add to what? So the answer is 4, right? So remember, we're going left to right. So the very first thing that we do is 3 times 4. And then we do the division by 6. And then we flip back and do the addition, right? So left to right, left to right. That's how we evaluate this stuff. Now, the exceptions to that are exponents. So 3 to 2 to 3 raised to the 2, 2 raised to the 5th, which is just crazy. Who the heck's doing all this stuff? Doesn't matter. Okay. So what we would do is we would evaluate 2 to the 5th, which I think is 32. And then we say 3 raised to the 32nd power, we'll say what that is. Okay? Then the other thing is that we work all this stuff out and then we stick it in the variable. So that's the one other exception to left to right. That is the number. Excuse me? Uh, I just plugged that in and it comes out to a couple billion. A couple billion. Excellent. Yeah, three to the thirty second. I know. Okay. Okay. Now, if you don't like the way this is all working out, the power is in your hands because all you have to do is stick in parentheses. <coughs> and parentheses actually get evaluated before everything. Okay. So you control how these complicated math expressions get worked out. Just throw some parentheses in to assist with you remembering this madness. Pendas, please excuse my dear aunt Sally. Parentheses, exponents, <laughs> multiplication, and division, and then addition and subtraction. If you can remember this, you have a high probability of correctly answering the question when it undoubtedly shows up on the test. What is negation? Negation. It would be turning a number into a negative number. So if I have 5, and I want to turn it into a negative 5, simply putting a dash in front of it, a hyphen in front of it, or multiplying it by negative 1, Either way, turns that magical 5, positive 5, into a negative 5. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, here we go, just to make it a little more complicated. If I have a negative 5 and I negate it, what happens? Positive 5. It goes to a positive 5. 
Negative and negative makes a positive. That's it. That's the last rule that we have in our formulation. Alright. Precedence rules. Let's do some examples. 4 plus 3 to the second. Let's see what it looks like. What was it? 4 plus 3 to the second. How do we do the 3 to the second? Like that? Four plus two plus one to the second, right? And there's some parentheses in there, right? So it's four plus two plus one to the second. Like that? Did that look correct? Woo! What's the next one? Four plus negative one. So what, how much did they pay on dinner? Alright, 
Yeah, it seems as though they're going to leave a tip. Maybe we should calculate the tip now. Yeah. Can you tell? All right. All right, great. So, Shots, I can just do that. So, how much are they going to end up paying? 40,000. All right. Now. How is 1.1515%? So what it is, it's 100%, which is the $35, plus 15%, which is the tip that they want to do. So I could do 15% would be just that. But as far as that, you know, as you can write it, you know, $35.27, right? They want to leave a 15% tip, and it seems like each one of those three people should pay a portion of that tip. Is that correct? That makes sense. Got it. So we're going to multiply by 1.15. Look, what we could also do is multiply by 0.15, which would tell us our tip, but then we'd have to take that and add it back in to 35.27. Two different ways to do exactly the same thing. Really cool. You one point five and it says this is that's thirty-five plus the tip for this amount, which turned out to be forty bucks, right? Okay. And then once we figure this all out, each person wants to pay their fair part, so we're gonna do it there, we're going to divide by three. So let's see how much everybody's paying for this fantastic dinner this thing happens. Uh yeah. Thirteen. Oh, 13 bucks. Decimal numbers, which we generally don't say, but we really call them real numbers. 
So a real number is any number that has a decimal point in it. The reason that we in the world of computer science get interested in real numbers is because the way we store a real number in a computer is very different from how we store an integer. It's a pain in the butt to store a real number. Because what we end up doing is we store the number, but we also have to store the location of where that decimal point is. So it's more complicated inside the computer to store a real number. Okay? So oftentimes, in a lot of other languages, before you use a real number, you have to tell the computer that you're going to be using a real number. <coughs> Python, no problem. Uh, floating point numbers, uh, that's also a, a decimal. Um, decimal, real numbers, floating point numbers, we're all talking about stuff. We call it a floating point number because the decimal point floats around, depending on what's going on or something like that. You'll see it called this in different languages. Real numbers, floating point numbers, they all mean the same thing. It's a number that has a decimal point. Okay? Uh, mixed mode of arithmetic, uh, this is where you do stuff that has different types of numbers. So you can have an integer, and you could add it to a real number, and what's the result going to be? It'll always be a real number. So if I introduce something into an equation that has a decimal point, forever and ever, the results will have a decimal point. Okay? If I'm just adding up integers, maybe we should do this. It'll always be a real number. Alright. So we'll do 3 plus 4. I'm going to show you what the story is. Yay! We'll do print. So if I get a two zero plus six point seven, and eight point seven, right? So decimal points all over the place in that one. But here's where things get interesting. What happens if I do two plus six point seven? What do we think that answer would be? That's what? That's actually string what that one is. Okay. Uh, let's see. Int four point oh. The result is four. Now I'll try int four point seven. So what's the integer function doing? It's like a gigantic chainsaw for decimals, right? So go, chop it off and throw it away. Okay? So integer can transform a decimal number, something with a decimal point, into an integer, right? A number that we count. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So is it always rounding down? Or it's it just not rounding at all. 
get your chainsaw. Just chop it off at that decimal point and I'm throwing it away. Okay? Good question though, because we're going to do some rounding here in just a minute. That one, we're just going to chainsaw off and throw it away. Okay? Okay. Oh, hey, look. It's our buddy, Mr. Rounds. Now, careful. Hold on. It's going to get a little bit weird here. You guys, just stay with me on those. I'm going to take a peek at it. And do you guys remember rounding from yes. high school? What's the rule for rounding? Five or higher. Five, 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 five or higher, you go up. But there's another rule. You always round to the nearest even number, right? So if I have like two points, we'll, we'll just make it. I'll show you. Okay. So round 2.5. What should we get for round 2.5? 2.3. What? Round 2.5. Round 2.5. So here's the subtlety to what's going on. I apologize. I should not have done this because I started out this way. Let me try better now. We'll come back. Let's go round 2.4. 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 So round 2.6, what should we get? Stop. 2.6. Is 6 above or below 5? Above. Okay. So when we're above 5, what do we do? We go up to the next number. Okay. No, it's 5. Because 5 is halfway. Alright. If it's 4 and under, it rounds down all the time. Yeah. Six and above, they run up all the time. If it's five, they'll go to whichever one number is even. Okay. So you that actually said it exactly correct. Okay, so I want to make sure everybody's on board here. So we had 2.4 and we rounded it. Okay? 0.4 is less than that midway point in the time, right? So whenever it's less than halfway, it's always going to go to the number just before. Okay? So in this case, it went to two. Now I have two. Question. Why does the time do that? Short answer on that one is it's a rule. Okay. Now I have 2.6. I'm getting ready to round it. When I do that, what did it go to? Went to three, right? So anything above five, and I'm doing rounding, it'll go up to the next number. Where things get weird, and I promised it was going to get a little bit weird, is that 0.5 thing. Okay? So I think we did it here, right? We did a round of 2.5 and it went to two. Because five can go either way. It's the gist on this one. So what happens if we do a round of three point five? It does. So what did three point five do? So once again, the weirdness is because it's a rule round. It has nothing to do with five, right? So if you have a point five. You round to the nearest even number. Okay? The chill that happens is you don't bump into points on it. Point four and below, or point six and above, and you do point four nine. But this is the rule for rounding. Uh, string. Well, we had talked a little while ago about. Right? The number. Yay! But what happens if we do string? Yeah, I just got to do this. So, me. Lord of the Rings. There's a number. Me equals 100.
say, can't convert int object to string implicitly. Okay? And the reason is because new name, I converted, I said, I would like to have the string version of this number, which means it's one, character one, followed by character zero, followed by character zero. And you can't add one to that, because it does let you a bunch of characters. So the gist of this is just because something is of one type, doesn't mean it has to stay that type. You can convert it to anything you name of it. This is the cool kid stuff. So you don't need to know this, but if you want to impress the other software developers, this is the kind of stuff that impresses them. So look, incrementing things, adding one to something, is that we do we do that all the time in software development. In fact, it's so common that they come up with a really quick shorthand notation. Sum plus equals one. What that means is sum equals sum plus one. Okay? It's a little shorthand notation. If you're part of the cool inside circle, you do this. And everyone goes, wow, you're so cool. Because you know about that. Cool thing, of course, is that the same thing goes on for decrement. So sum minus equals one is the exact same thing as sum equals sum minus one. Do you need to know this? Absolutely not. You can type this out and this will work perfectly fine. If you're cool, you do it this way. Right? But this works just perfectly okay. All right? Then the one other thing that I want to remind you about is exponents. You guys remember exponents? One times 10 to the third, all that sort of stuff like that. So if I'm the number of one million, one million, okay? Another way to write that in the real world is 1 times 10 to the 6th, right? Yes? That's the hyphen in front of all of them. That's not part of the rest. You talking about this one here? No. The left. Yes. Right. That does not exist. You're right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's a negative one. Right. I, excellent question. Very good question. So one, another way of writing 1 million is 1 times 10 to the 6th. In Python, you can type 1 e 6 and it will know what you're talking about. So if you have to deal with really big numbers, you just do ease and you're good to go. I guess it just chose to do that. Now remember, if I did it, oh, I'm sorry, it didn't make it a decimal. What did it make it? A float, right? Your, your point is wrong, because what it really has is a decimal point. You're 100% correct on that. But whenever there's a decimal point there, we call it a float. Okay? But if I wanted to get rid of that, could I get rid of that? Yes. And the answer is yes. I could use int, right? So if I did int, Around that, I would get one million without that last one, right? So I could convert it if I wanted. I mean, not to do it. So let's do that, shall we? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to do print. So we int. One, two, three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yep. Is that it? Just try. So now that actually is a decimal one million, as opposed to a float one million. Make sense? Good question. All right, listen to your Python toolkit now. Look, you got math! Yay! The uh, toolkits are filled up. I'm going to have to get you your toolkit, right? All right, so now you got two things. Okay, so what did we cover today? We talked about what variables are. Good, bad, ugly. Yes. Remember, it's a way of documenting what your code does. Do a good job on your variables. Everybody will love you. Do a bad job. You'll be hated forever and ever. Okay? What makes a good and bad variable name? We talked about how to do math in Python. We talked about operator precedence, which I indicated was Ooh, just calling out to be included in our test. And we talked about mixed mode of arithmetic. God, well that should be it, right? We've covered everything there is in Python. There cannot possibly be anything else for us to cover, right? Yes, sir. What? No However, we do have strings and input and output. 
So we'll hit that one next time. Is that like a fair deal? We're done. Next time, guys, see you then.